Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing the behavior and body language of Richard Kuklinski. Richard Kuklinski, otherwise known as the Iceman, claimed to have murdered upwards of 200 people. He said that he worked for mafia families and also said that he murdered Jimmy Hoffa. What we're going to be looking at today is his behavior and body language because a number of people have dismissed these claims. They've alleged that he in fact did not murder anywhere near the number he said. He was found guilty back in the 1980s of murdering four men and later confessed to another. Beyond that, a number of people have challenged the possibility that he, in fact, actually murdered so many people. Before we get started with today's analysis, I do want to remind you that this is not a psychological evaluation of any kind. These are just my opinions based on publicly available information. In addition to that, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. We're going to be looking at a number of interview segments today to see what his body language tells us. Let's just jump right in. People get killed. Now, this was interesting. We're starting the very, very beginning here. He was asked, how many people have you killed? And you see him do something strange with his mouth. I'm going to explain this, but I'm going to pause on it. Watch this. How many people have you killed? Now, oftentimes when we do things with our lips, we do that to calm ourselves. We do that to soothe ourselves. So as he's doing this, you would think that somebody has, who has murdered 100 people probably wouldn't be very rattled by a question like this. But he's showing signs of stress already before answering this question. All right, approximate guess. Approximate will go with more than 100. So you, we're seeing a number of signs of discomfort as he's saying this. But I was surprised that even though he doesn't show a ton of expression on his face, that he seemed this stressed and this anxious as he's talking about this. I'll show you exactly what I mean. Approximate will go. So right now he's closing his eyes right here. We sometimes do this when we're lying or when we're saying something that isn't true because we don't like to look at the person talking to us because it's easier to lie when we're not, in fact, looking at that person. Now, I've talked about people closing their eyes for different reasons in other interviews, like Ted Bundy did it, but it was for some very, very different reason. His timing was very, very different. This I interpret potentially very differently. Oh, wait. More than 100. And then afterward, when he looks at the interviewer, now sometimes when people look at the interviewer, like Jeffrey Dahmer, for example, he would do that. It looked almost like he wanted to see the reaction, that he wanted to intimidate a little bit. It's harder to say with him. It could be that he wants to see what his reaction is to see if he's believed, or it could be that he's trying to intimidate. That look doesn't look like a look of intimidation to me as much as some of the other serial killers that we've watched before. And part of the reason I say that is you can see his head's tilted, it's sort of facing down a little bit. He's not sitting up. It doesn't seem as confident as in, and as intimidating as a lot of the serial killers that we watch talk about these things. How do you feel about killing? I don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. So as you see right there, he's raising his eyebrows when he says, it doesn't bother me at all. Watch this. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. So that's what he wants people to hear. It doesn't bother me at all. Well, he's in the bathroom. We put a little boost in his uh, his food, and um, he was rushed to the hospital after that, and uh, he died, and they buried him. So one of the things that we're not seeing are the typical signs of excitement or the typical connection to the claims that he's making. Now, obviously, it's possible that somebody could commit these awful murders and show you nothing, but oftentimes there is excitement around it. There's some kind of, there's lip licking, there's movement, but he shows no connection to it whatsoever, which is almost suspicious because even people like Ted Bundy who are able to commit the most vicious and unbelievable atrocities imaginable, even he has emotions leak out when he's talking about these things. I'm not exactly sure what they put on, what they attributed his debt to, but you know. Now this was interesting. Watch this right here. And uh, he died. And they buried him. 
I'm not exactly sure what they put on, what they attributed his death to. Now that was an interesting point for him to make. I'm not sure what they attributed his death to. A somewhat unnecessary claim to make because that's another way of saying you can't look this up. There's no way to know whether or not this happened because they may have attributed his death to something else. So it's impossible to verify. So including that detail was unnecessary and in some ways makes his claim less believable. You throw it anywhere. It all depends if you don't want it found or if you want it found. If you want it found, it doesn't matter. You just leave it there. If you don't want it found, you could take it somewhere. You could bury it. One of the things that, once again, is so interesting about how he presents is that Oftentimes, when there's people that are psychopathic, they are intense. They like to stare you down. They like to intimidate. Even people that are interviewing them, they like to have that intimidation factor, particularly when they're talking about things like this. Right now, he's looking anywhere but the interviewer, so I find that really interesting. Watch this part again. If you don't want it found, you could take it somewhere. You could bury it. Are there any murders that you committed that, that haunt you, that you just sort of, you feel and you do? Now, this was also interesting. Now, he was asked if he's committed any murders that haunt him. Watch his expression right here. Are there any murders that you committed that, that haunt you, that you just sort of, you feel? So he's looking away, he's turning his head, and I interpret that as that he wants to distance himself from this question that there may be things in his life that he has done that he feels uncomfortable with, and he does not want the interviewer to see that. So he's physically moving his face away. The fact that that's his initial reaction, I think, is very telling. Watch this one last time. Are there any murders that you committed that that haunt you? Just sort of you feel and you... Nothing haunts me. No murders haunt me. Another couple of things that are strange about him. One, he keeps chewing gum, which I think is a prop. I talk about how people that are deceiving or telling lies oftentimes use props, whether it's a piece of paper, a pen, chewing gum, something used to distract, something used to explain away different behaviors they engage in. No murders haunt me. Nothing. I don't think about it. That's why it's hard for me to tell you. But in order for me to be able to tell you when something happened, I'd have to think about why, when. If I think about it, it would wind up hurting me. So I don't, I don't think about it. Now, this is a very interesting psychological statement. It also conflicts with some of the things that he said, which is basically... Nothing hurts me. I don't think about these things. But he's saying it would hurt him to think about, which is fascinating. Because oftentimes when there's somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, one of these types, when they think about the things they've done, you can see the excitement on their face. They close their eyes. They're soaking it all in. They love this stuff. So the idea that him thinking about bad things that he's done would hurt him is very interesting and runs very contrary to what he's been saying so far. Let's watch this part again, then we'll keep going. It would wind up hurting me, so I don't I don't think about it. And you're seeing a lot of stress on his face. He was just blinking a lot. He's looking around a lot. He's doing a lot of things with his mouth. He is showing signs of stress right now as he talks about this. So I doubt I don't think about it. If I look at the stress on his face afterward, look at the way he chews his gum. So that that biting, he's trying to process lots of stress going on in his body right now. He is feeling discomfort as he's talking about this, whether or not it's because he's being deceptive, because he hasn't actually done the things that he's claimed, or there's things that have happened in his past that he's now thinking about that he's uncomfortable with. We're seeing almost an aggressive way to try to subdue these feelings as he chews on his gum. You'll see what I'm talking about right here. Think about it.
this constant chewing that he's doing. Once again, this is likely a way to help manage stressful feelings during this interview. But I can't change yesterday. I've done that. To dismember them, yes. So he just said, I've done that, and then he kind of closes his eyes. Watch oh. this right here. Yes. I've done that. Sometimes we close our eyes after we say something because we don't want to see the reaction to the person we're talking to. So in a sense, when he's closing his eyes right there, it's either because he's thinking about something he doesn't like or he doesn't really want to see the reaction of the interviewer after he says that, yes, he's cut somebody up with a chainsaw, but not while they were alive. To dismember them, yes. Not to kill them, no. What was it like to cut somebody up with a chainsaw? How did you feel to cut some guy up with a Chainsaw. Well, I didn't have any feeling one way or the other. And this is where things become less believable because he's been very inconsistent throughout this interview talking about what he does feel, what he doesn't feel, whether he feels bad, whether he doesn't, whether he wants to think about these things. But when he says it so plainly that he didn't feel anything one way or the other is not consistent with what he has said so far. That, that just happened. That's the way it had to be. That it might, it probably would offend a lot of people. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I should. I'll go into that. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not a good one. No, go ahead. Tell him. It was a man. He was begging. So. You'll notice that the interviewer said, no, go ahead, come on. Now, one of the things that's surprising is that that didn't make him angry because typically people like this are very much control freaks and they don't like being spoken to that way. I wouldn't even like being spoken to that way. So if somebody who said they've killed 200 people is, been, is being spoken to in this way, it would be very surprising that he actually goes along with what he's being asked to do. I don't know. I don't think I should I'll go into that. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not a good one. No, go ahead. Tell so now go ahead. Come on. That's a command. That's not a request of, hey, would you mind? Blah, blah, blah. This is a command with someone who is, from all accounts, a complete control freak. So I think it's very interesting that at that point he didn't shut down completely. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and change the circumstances he'd have that time but God never showed up and he never changed the circumstances and this all sounds so performative he describes it almost like a movie it's very theatrical the way that he's talking about this. Does that immediately mean that it's not true? No, but in some ways this adds to the doubt around the things that he's claimed he's done. He said, oh, I got the money right here. And he came back. Now you'll already notice he's breathing heavier. He says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, how am I going to get this merchandise? I put the gun under his chin, and I said, there is no merchandise. And I shot him. He didn't die. Now this, once again, this is another sign of intense stress as he's talking about this. So as he's been talking so far saying, Hey, I don't feel anything when I think about this stuff or nothing, none of this hurts me. None of this affects me as he's talking about things that he's claimed that he's done. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing quite a lot of stress. Actually, the gun jammed. He was gurgling. I had hit him. It was, uh, blood was pouring out of his mouth. And, uh, he's squinting a lot. His the t speech is slowing down. 
His breathing's getting heavier. This is someone who is experiencing a lot of stress as he's talking about this. Now, there's always a possibility that there's aspects of this that are not true and he's stressed because he's lying. But there is a lot of stress right now as he's talking about this. He was in a, I would imagine a lot, it looked like he was in a lot of pain. So there was a tire iron in there. I took the tire iron and hit him with it which knocked him out. And uh, you're hearing the continued deep breathing. He's squinting his eyes. There's once again, a lot of discomfort. He died. I then took him and put him in a 50 gallon drum. People that mean everything to me. At this point, he's talking about the impact that his actions have had on his family. Boy. I can make this one. So this is giving us a really good idea of real tells he has when he's under distress. Because right now, he really, truly is on the verge of tears. This is not a performance of his. I do think that the impact of what he's done and the impact it's had on his family is genuinely difficult for him. This would never be me. This would not be me. So we're seeing the chewing pick up. We're seeing a lot around the mouth. He's not looking at the interviewer. He's keeping his gaze completely averted. I feel for my family. See, biting his tongue. All of these things, when the emotions are coming up, this is how he manages them. And if you look at these behaviors and you apply them throughout the rest of the interview, it gives you some clues into when he is feeling stressed. So this is sort of a baseline of what is genuine stress for him. You see the Iceman cry. You see the clenching of the teeth. That goes back to the idea that him chewing gum is a way for him to manage difficult emotions. Now we're going to watch just a minute of a psychiatrist interviewing Richard Kuklinski. So, if I understand you correctly, you're positive you killed more than 50 people. And Definitely. I think you probably killed more than 100 people. Definitely. You'll notice he's not looking at him when he says this. Now, eye contact can be a little different with each person. So sometimes when people are looking away, it doesn't always mean they're lying. But in situations like this, making such a bold claim, oftentimes people with positions like him would look deeply at the other person to show what they had done. Right now, he's literally avoiding all eye contact. We'll go back through this and we'll keep going. So if I understand you correctly, you're positive you killed more than 50 people. And Definitely. I think you probably killed more than 100 people. Definitely. Sure of that one. Definitely. But not sure it's more than 200. I wouldn't say definitely to that. Maybe yes, maybe no. I would say less than 200 people. Well, you tell me. So you see the smile on his face as he's thinking about the fact that he is talking to this psychiatrist who seems to be thinking... Maybe you killed more than 200 people. Maybe you killed less. I need to get your answers from this. So he's looking at him as though that's a legitimate question. It's not less than 200 people. You killed more than 200 people. Sure. Yep. So <laughs> you see he looks away, looking down at a piece of paper. Sure. Yep. He's answering it in a way that doesn't sound very convincing, not very strong. He's just sort of, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, sure. I killed more than 200 people. Let's listen to this part again. You killed more than 200 people. Sure. Yep. I killed, basically, more 100 people when I was a young man. Before I even knew anybody. You see now he's obscuring his face. He's rubbing his forehead. We oftentimes do this when we're starting to feel stressed. And so as he's coming up with, I killed 100 people when I was a young man... You're seeing him do soothing behaviors. He's doing things to pacify himself and obscure the way that he looks. Too much. 
the one part of my life I have killed people. And you see the smile afterward. There's some excitement with saying this because it's such a bold thing that makes him sound so powerful. Too much. The one part of my life I have killed people for nothing. Just for somebody to look at me wrong, I would kill them. So that pretty much wraps things up for our analysis of Richard Kuklinski. I'm sure you're wondering, is he telling the truth or was he lying? You may have gathered over the course of this that I do not believe that he is telling the truth the vast majority of the time. I believe there were multiple signs of deception. I do not believe that he murdered 100 and certainly not 200 people. Did he murder anybody? Possibly. But I think that everything that he talked about was greatly exaggerated. I've watched a lot of different killers over a lot of years, and his body language was not consistent with somebody who would have been able to commit the types of acts that he talked about, certainly not in that volume. That doesn't mean that he has never done anything bad. That doesn't mean that he has never killed anybody. But what it does mean is that he has not murdered 200 people, and certainly not in some of the ways that he's described. So hopefully this analysis helps you better understand my perspective on this and why I think that he had signs of deception. I know that there definitely will be some people that disagree with that, and that's fine. Please let me know in the comments below if you think that he, in fact, is telling the truth about everything that he says. Also, this idea came from so many of you commenting that you wanted to see an analysis of Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman. So if there are other people that you want to see, I do listen. I do analyses based on what people want to see. So please let me know in the comments below if there are other analyses that you're looking forward to. Last thing before we get finished up is that I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.